Hi, I'm Tom Rinaldi. I'm Christiana Pena. And we're going to be walking around this evening and looking at historic signs and storefronts in the Yorkville neighborhood of Manhattan on the Upper East Side. Come along with us. We're going to start tonight here at Glazer's Bake Shop on First Avenue. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Glazer's, Tom? So we're here at Glazer's just in a nick of time, as it turns out. Uh, their last day is going to be just a few days from now. Uh, I think they're open maybe two or three more days. After uh, how many years here on the After, I think, 116 years. Wow. I, th their sign, I think, says established 1902. I can't do that uh, math. Someone else, right, do it yeah. among yourselves. Yeah, especially not on a day like today. Yeah. But we, so we're getting in really just under the wire here, and you can see we're not the only people that have come to yeah. get in and, you know, just get one last black and white cookie, which is what uh, Glazers is probably best known for. I think it's actually pronounced Glossers. Oh. In fact, and hopefully we'll have a chance later on to ask somebody who can teach us about the pronunciation, yeah. uh, make sure we're getting it right. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, uh, has been here since 1902, uh, 116 years they lasted. Wow. And uh, so it's another one of these kind of disappearing businesses of New York. Uh, in this instance, I don't think they're leaving because of anything like a rent height. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's just, uh, you know, been in the family, the same family now for right. generations, and it's just sort of run its course. and. There's no heirs that want to take over the business, unfortunately, so um, that'll be that. Yeah, but we'll enjoy the signage at the very least for as long as we can. I'm sure that's one of the things that people who walk this stretch of First Avenue are so used to seeing. It's, it's just so classic, such a throwback feel to it. Well, there are certain storefronts that really stand out for their historic signage, uh, and this is definitely one of them. Uh, it was pictured in a book uh, of photography by photographers James and Carla Murray, uh, focusing on historic storefronts around New York City. And this is one of very few that made it in that book uh, and from the whole Upper East Side of Manhattan. The cool. storefront itself, as we see it now, uh, is not nearly as old as the business. The business has been here since 1902. Uh, the storefront and the signage, I think, dates to about 1965, the mid-1960s, uh, in any case. But it's now more than 50 years old already, okay. and so really stands out compared to everything else around it. And as I always say about historic signs, uh, if the job of a sign is to stand out, and be as eye-catching as possible. Nothing does that better than an old sign, especially yeah. an old neon sign, which is my specialty, and we'll be looking at a few neon signs in the neighborhood here tonight. Uh, the Glazer sign, or Glasser sign, uh, is not neon, obviously, but it has a, a, some of the kind of tropes that huh. were very common for storefront signs of the mid-20th century and early 20th century. Kind of the uh, scripted appeal? The scripted, yeah, exactly. The, na the name of the business, the business owner, is here uh, in script almost as though it's could be a signature, yeah. whereas kind of the generic copy, to use the sign industry uh, uh, sort of jargon, uh, is in just block letters. Uh, in this case, I don't think it's Helvetica, but it could be Helvetica. It was getting yeah. into that period in the mid to late 1960s where that was starting to become common. So uh, the materials and the typography, the style of the lettering really kind of, uh, you know, give you a sense for when this thing was made, yeah. uh, which we'll see over and over again as we look at different storefront Ooh, signs They're all going here. in. Maybe we should follow them before all the black and whites are gone. Yeah, let's, let's see go. if we can get the last black and white of the day. All right. You're Mr. Glasser? Yes, I am. Her. Her. Are we saying Glasser right? Close enough. Glasser. Okay. We pronounce it. Glasser. Yep. And it's German. Yes. And Yorkville is a German neighborhood. Yes. So uh, who is your ancestor who came here and opened the business? My grandfather. Uh, he came from Bavaria, a little town called Walsassen um, in northeastern Bavaria. He came here in 1902. Well, he came in before that. We opened here in 1902, yeah. but he did open another shop downtown, Midtown, briefly. That was only a couple of years. Before coming up. Yeah, yeah. But then he saw that this building was for sale. He bought the building way back then, which is the only thing that's kept us going this yeah. long. You know. and, and so it's been how long? 116 years. 116 years. And how much longer will it continue? Um, today's Thursday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Three days. Uh, and then what? <laughs> My brother and I are retiring. Yeah? Yeah. So in 116 years, how many cookies would you estimate you've made in that amount of time? I could not possibly <laughs> estimate. Yeah. 
Um, have you enjoyed being a part of, of oh, Yorkville? Sure. Kind of how have you seen the neighborhood change in the time that you've been here, especially the businesses like your own? Yeah, a lot of them have obviously closed and gone away. The neighborhood's changed a lot. Uh, it used to be more families, larger families. Now it's a lot more single people, but it's still a great neighborhood. Uh, um, if anything, it's improved. Yeah. Um, but you know, small businesses have died out. Yeah. Um, which is a shame. One of them is I think I'm, um, you know, being a small businessman. I, yeah. You know, I like seeing small businesses. But, uh, it's just very difficult in Manhattan anymore. Oh, yeah. To keep it going. Definitely not getting any easier. No. Yeah. no. And is there any bakery that you think is kind of going to fill the niche that you're, or the void that you're going to be leaving behind, or it opens the door, I guess, for somebody new to give yeah. it a Yeah, yeah, probably. You know, this type of bakery, I think, is very difficult to run in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a small town bakery, basically. Yeah. Um, you know. We is don't sell high-end stuff, so it's not terribly expensive, so we don't make that much money, but, you know, it's yeah. kind of plenty for me, you know. But the black and white cookie, which is, you're kind of right. famous for that, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, we get written up about it all the time. Yeah, and it, I was reading, it, it, does, it does have some German roots. Yeah, um, well, although I was interviewed recently by a woman from a German newspaper, and she says in Germany they're called Americanas. Oh, <laughs> so I don't know where it originated, really. Some people have claimed that we did, we originated them, but I can't say that. Well, thank you so much for having us here. We feel really lucky that we got a chance to yeah, come in. Yeah, we really talk about it under the wire. Shawler and Weber, am I saying it right? Shawler and Weber, exactly. Shawler and Weber, okay. Which yeah. has been in Yorkville uh, in operation since when? 1937. 1937. Right. And you're Chris? I'm Chris. And the, the business was started, they were actually German immigrants who started the business. Oh yeah, uh, Ferdinand Schaller, my Ferdinand boss's Schaller. Grand, uh, grandfather. Okay. Started the business. It came over in 1937. Yeah. Uh, he, I don't think he had a nickel to his name, maybe five dollars in his pocket, and he met a guy named Tony Weber. Met, they actually met here. Right. But Weber and was also from Germany, right? Or? I'm not too sure about it. We don't talk about him too much. Oh, okay. you know, ever since, uh, well, I, I mean, <laughs> ever since they bought him out. But okay. um, they, uh, they started. He, uh, Ferdinand had all the recipes. He was the, he was the true butcher. Yeah. He learned all the, the whole trade back in Germany, Stuttgart, Germany. Okay. He came over and uh, they opened up Charles and Weber. They used to make everything downstairs in the basement. Yeah. They had uh, they had big coolers down there, uh, uh, smoke houses, everything. They made everything. Uh, then uh, it just got too big. Yeah. And uh, they bought out they bought out uh, Tony Weber, but they kept the name. There's a clause that as long as we have this store or they have this store, they have to keep it Charles and Weber. Yeah. They have other locations too, or uh, Jeremy is planning on opening up other locations. As you know, he opened up our Stuber next door, okay, where it features all our uh, sausages, and uh, he's opening up some uh, 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 place downtown in Chelsea Market. Oh, okay, yeah, that's in the in works, and he's also going to work. He's working on opening up a restaurant downstairs. Yeah, in the 18 years that you've been here. Uh, were there other kind of vestiges of the, the sort of German immigrant roots of Yorkville that have kind of disappeared in that time? Or? Oh yeah, even before I worked here, there was a, a fish store next door, and I worked there for 12 years. I used to fantasize, well, fantasize, you know, I would see the old German uh, butcher, uh, manager, Ludwig, yeah. who would be outside, and he would, just talking to him, and people would, on the street would talk to him, and he would command so much respect, yeah. and I would, I would, I would wish that I had his job. Yeah. And now I, ha now I yeah. have his job. And, uh, yeah, um, he told me when I first came here, he says, uh, back in the day, you couldn't walk down 86th Street without speaking German. Yeah. It was all German. Uh, bars, uh, dance halls, restaurants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's still your neighbors, the Heidelberg, right? The Heidelberg, yeah. They've, uh, they've been here since, like, 1970 or 1960. Yeah. We're going to go over and say hi to them in a minute. Yeah. See what, what they can tell us about it. But. Oh yeah, they can tell. Um, they they actually uh, still speak German there. My really? boss uh, Jeremy, he speaks German. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I speak uh, a little bit. Your boss is the second generation or third generation? Third generation. Third generation. Third generation. Third generation. Yeah. generation yeah. When we look around in here, like what? Uh, how long is all this in here? How long does it look? Well, like, like the ceiling. The ceiling was put in in 1960, probably about the wow. time I was born. Uh, so it's like the tile floors. When it was when they first opened, the store only came up to that post, and it was half the size. We didn't have the the big cooler over there and they expanded it a lot over the years. Yeah. It was just a little storefront. Uh, we have a picture of Ferdinand Shala behind the counter over there. Okay. And you can see him. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, product. <laughs> there is actually a, um, a tradition here at Charlotte and Weber that every child, every child that walks in here gets a slice of our award-winning bologna. And we have, uh, we have customers that, 70 years old that remember getting slices of bologna when they were a kid. And yeah, that's, that's a great tradition. It's a variation oh, yeah. on like the lollipop tradition. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's yeah. a little bit kind of cooler. Exactly, yes. <laughs> you know? If you like, maybe we can give you a taste of our beer too. We have beer on tap now. This oh. is a Jer this is a Jeremy uh, Jeremy innovation. Innovation, okay. exactly. He, yep. he, we probably have the largest selection of German beers <laughs> in, uh, in oh, New okay. York. Yeah, we have uh, Germany over there. We have some from Switzerland, but mostly from Germany. And you got some on tap too. Yeah, and we have three three beers on tap here. They rotate. When one goes out, we put a new uh, another new one on, so it's always different, new and yeah. different. In our Stuber next door, they also have three beers on tap. Barbara. You're Barbara? Yes. It's, it's really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> so you've been, how long have you been a customer here at the Heidelberg? Oh my God, I mean I had that person since 1963. You've oh. been coming here since yes, 1963? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. Where are you from originally? From Bavaria. You're from Germany. Bavaria? I lived in Jersey and had for 12 years. Yes. Yeah. since I know Heidelberg, you know, yeah. since I know Heidelberg. But Heidelberg bought the place in 1964 and in 1965 it took over. The so, Edler family, Edler, Edler, Edler. Edler, Edler and Edler, that's who Edler. still runs it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the Edler family was, still running I it? I was once a partner with the loser in here. Yeah, that's I, right. They said you I worked walked, here. I walked behind the bar. Yeah. You, were, you were bartended here? <laughs> I walked behind the bar, yeah, yeah. When was that? How, long, how much did we miss that by? That was in the... End of 60, 70, I thought Oh, we that missed now. that by a little while. I'm 92, I'm going to be 92. 92? I'm going to be 93 in August. Yes. So is the secret something yeah. that they serve here I that know, we can I, have? I know all, I know all the, the tricks from Heidelberg. I know everything. What, what, I know how to set the tables. I know I could walk down the kitchen. I could walk behind the bar. I could do anything and everything. I walked, I helped in the kitchen. I helped in the bar. I helped in the dining room. There is nothing I would not know. <laughs> yeah. So, Yorkville was obviously was a German name. It was known as a German. Yes. Hungarians yes. also. No, no, it was German. German. But, it was and and what, what's, what's still here from that? What, how much of that is still here today? Look, the young ones, they don't come over anymore. They have a nice over here than over here. And the old ones, nice and slowly, die. We used to have a lot, a lot of German. Here's my Heidelberg question. What what is the significance of the heart? Don't you love you love Heidelberg? You yeah. Never from New York too. You love New York. You love Heidelberg. Yeah. That 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 means. So this the is the I love Heidelberg. This is the love heart. of Heidelberg. You know, it's the match, the match. That's that's the love of Heidelberg. For the, for the, I love New York, I love Heidelberg. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, I love Heidelberg. That's the way it is, you know. Yeah. Zion St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church on East City, 4th Street, mm -hmm. uh, opened in 1892 uh, as sort of an uptown branch of a church that uh, already existed, a congregation, a German congregation down on the Lower East Side. Right. Um, that was St. Mark's. This was Zion Evangelical. I 
is how the story goes. Okay. And so is that part of why we saw this community grow in this area? There was an area? uptown migration Got from it. Kleine Deutschland down on the Lower East Side Let's to... Let's see that again. There was an uptown migration from Kleine Deutschland, Kleine Deutschland Got it. Okay. down on the Lower East Side cool. to Yorkville. Mm -hmm. um, and so as the crowded Lower East Side started to get really just too crowded, yeah. this was almost like the suburbs. So a lot of the German and other Eastern European immigrants who had first kind of landed and got their feet on the ground mm -hmm. down on the Lower East Side started to come up this way. Uh, there was a really unfortunate incident in 1904 involving this congregation where their St. Mark's, which was their Kleiner Deutschland on the Lower East right. Side congregation, uh, this was the group that was involved in the infamous General Slocum fire. Oh, yeah. This was the church outing on the steamboat that caught fire with the tragic death. It was the worst disaster in New York history until 9-11, I think. Right. This prompted more of the congregation to move up this way. So eventually, a few decades later, the, the congregations actually merged uh, making this Zion St. Mark's uh, church, which is a as we see it now. Uh, it has the distinction, in addition to all of that, yeah. of having one of the very last neon crucifixes. Which is not something you see very often, not especially on a you know, church with this kind of a style, this kind of a design. Neon is not the, the, my immediate thing that I'm going to think you is going to have normally, happening. Exactly. As you wouldn't normally associate neon in churches. Yeah. But neon starts to, as signs uh, start to evolve, mm -hmm. neon kind of comes on the scene in New York by the 1920s, the early 1920s. Uh, and so, but what else was going on in New York in the 1920s? Prohibition. So the interesting irony is huh. that you had neon crucifixes in New York City before you had neon bar signs All right. and liquor store <laughs> signs. So when these churches started to hang neon signs, they were kind of competing with movie yeah. theaters and things. Oh. So in the 1920s and 30s, first incandescent bulb signs, and then they started to switch over to neon, were not all that uncommon in New York. This is now one of the very, very last ones. Uh, it was restored recently by a company called Artistic Neon that's out in Ridgewood, Queens. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's in great shape and yeah. not just hanging in there, but yeah. really uh, uh, glowing, resplendent yeah. on this hot summer evening. <laughs> Well, and I love the fact that even literally physically on the building there, it really still shows, it speaks to the, the immigrant heritage that's here in Yorkville, just with the engraving that's there in the stone. I mean, it's You get a, a juxtaposition even, of... Oh, I hadn't even seen down here as well. The I, If I could speak German, I would, but I'm not going to try, but it's just... I'm with you. <laughs> But it's wonderful. It is definitely German. And still, bi says. still, still bilingual services, German and English. It looks like that's right. So it still yeah. really is serving the community that came all the way up from so, Kleine yeah. Deutschland. From Kleine, Kleine Deutschland. There we go. So it's not a commercial institution, but mm -hmm. it's definitely still a living vestige mm -hmm. of that immigrant Eastern European and German uh, flavor of the neighborhood yeah. um, here, and a glow tonight. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for bringing me here. Thanks for coming. <laughs>
without going into the census records, we don't know a whole lot about Adolf Stern, mm -hmm. where he came from, but presumably he was probably part of the Eastern European mm -hmm. uh, sort of immigration fl you know, influx into this neighborhood. And not just Catholics or Protestants, but also a lot of Eastern European Jews came to the neighborhood too, like the Marx Brothers, who oh. lived up on East 93rd Street. Right, yep, grew up cool. in, a, in a tenement that's still there. Um, so this clock is, is uh, left over from that, uh, from Adolf Stern's uh, jeweler uh, that was here. Uh, later, it advertised a pawn shop, uh, and it, before its restoration in the 1980s, it had a relic, the last kind of relic of its commercial past. Uh, those three balls of the pawn shop mm -hmm. were actually hanging off over the, the top of it. Oh. It's sort of distinct feature that it looks like a, a watch with a watch fob because <laughs> yeah. it was advertising a jeweler. It, it has a twin in Santa Fe, New Mexico, oh. interestingly. Um, it has also a cameo in the film The Lost Weekend where the drunk, uh, played by Ray Milan, is stumbling down 3rd Avenue, uh -huh. at that time in the shadow of the 3rd Avenue elevated subway, uh -huh. uh, and kind of like leans, he's looking for a place to hawk stuff. Yeah. So this was a, a, became a pawn shop. Right, right. And so he, he sort of finds it, but everything's closed. Huh. So he can't hawk anything to get his booze for the weekend. He, finds, he, he figures something else out. <laughs> it all you know, works you know, out. Yeah, don't worry. He, yeah. he was fine. Fine <laughs> in the end. Um, so then later the 3rd Avenue L was torn down and this really kind of fell into to terrible disrepair uh -huh. before it was restored in the, uh, as we said, in the late 80s and yeah. then restored again with the help of the Friends of the Upper East Side in about 10 years later uh, in the late 90s. And now it looks good, but I think it's... It's not quite telling the right it's time. It's only right twice a day. <laughs> that's true, that's true. And do you, oh, there's a plaque, I guess we could always look, but do you know off the top of your head how many in this family of clocks are landmarked here? I don't know. I think it's something about a dozen, maybe okay. ten or twelve or so around the city. Okay. And hopefully they have a nice solid list. No one's going to accidentally sell Cart one of them. Cart them off somewhere. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, you one know. can hope. One can hope. Great. But Excellent. The Yorkville clock. <laughs>
uh, got eventually this great kind of classic New York idea of opening a tropical drinks shop, which then became a tropical drinks slash Frankfurter shop, and people speculate kind of that picking they up on what may was have happening New Yorkville the Frankfurter influence. Uh, and so here we are now, uh, what, 90, almost 90 years later. I mean, if you want a delicious drink and a snappy Frankfurter, where do you go? For your health sake. Yeah. You know, tastier than Papaya filet mignon, cake. I hear. <laughs> exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, the, and the sign company, too, has an interesting immigrant uh, history. It was okay. uh, the LaSalle Sign Company uh, started in 1900 uh, by uh, an immigrant called uh, Joseph Langsner, who I think was part Transylvanian and part Polish, okay. uh, if I remember right. Uh, and this company eventually became called the LaSalle Sign Company, was in the same family for three generations. Uh, the last owner, uh, I think, formally shut it down after exa almost exactly 100 years. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, bad. they retired, and it was another one of these stories, like we saw over yeah. at Glazers, where the next generation just, you know, didn't want to take it over. In fact, I think, right. if I remember right, Justin Langsner, the last president of the sign company, said, I'm not going to let my kids get into oh, this really? business. It was oh. kind of a rough and tumble uh, sort of a business. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, so we have the transition here from into the neon era, like we saw the neon cross uh, over at the church, mm -hmm. uh, into this uh, era of kind of backlit plastic signs yeah. uh, as they have over at the Heidelberg. Yeah. Kind of a classic example at the Heidelberg of the kinds of signs that succeeded neon, cheaper than a Buick, uh, Buick Wildcat convertible to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, to install. Excellent. Well, and here so, there's, so there's so much neon now. I mean, it's expanded beyond the primary sign to all these kind of secondary signs, and so it just really glows this corner, yes, right? Yes, well, I think they know what they have <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah, you know, it's also one of the last <laughs> uh, examples of an animated neon sign in the city with oh, this yeah. great flashing arrow here, where this was once very, very common. And now the few uh, neon storefront signs that are left in New York, you almost will never see anything in any way animated. So this is uh, kind of another great example, you know, that really should be landmarked. You listening? Landmarks Commission? <laughs> well, I'm ready for maybe a number five, a bullseye, or possibly I'm a I'm ready for five hot dogs. All right. Got to not forget the papaya, though. Yeah, that's true. We've earned it. Yeah. All right. We have. I think. <laughs> well, Christiana, I don't know, I'm feeling a little parched. Jeez, I, I wonder, what, what do you think? <coughs> what, what, what would help me feel better? Tom. A papaya drink. Oh my god, of course. For your health. Oh, go. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>